Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'd like to begin by introducing Miriam Noriega, ACLU of Colorado's Director of People and Culture, who's going to share a land acknowledgement. Miriam. Welcome everyone. We begin this event by honoring and acknowledging that we are on the traditional territories of ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, Ute and Arapaho nations. As these words of acknowledgement are spoken and heard, the ties that these nations have to the traditional homelands are renewed and reaffirmed. Let us also acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal from this territory. We respect the many diverse indigenous peoples still connected to this land on which we gather. We pay our respect to them and give thanks to all tribal nations and the ancestors of this place. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. This webinar will be recorded and shared on our website for others um, who could not make it at this time. If you have any questions, please put those in our chat or in the Q&A box. And here is a, a little overview of what we're gonna cover today. So first off on our agenda, it's going to be letters to the editor. Then we'll get into how you can be effective on social media, uh, followed by using your voice in action. Then we'll have a Q&A. And then following that, we'll have a survey and a special performance by the Denver Gay Men's Chorus. Next slide, please. So uh, my name is Deanna Hirsch. I am the ACLU of Colorado Donor Relations Officer. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'll pass it over to Vanessa Michelle. Hi, I'm Vanessa Michelle, and I'm the ACLU of Colorado Director of Communications. And my pronouns are she, her, Aya, and I'll pass it to Kyle. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all so much for having me today. I'm so honored to be here. I'm with Healthier Colorado. I'm the Senior Director of Communications, he, him, and I wore my summer shirt because uh, it's beautiful outside and I wanted to remind folks that we're getting into nice weather. I love it. Thank you, Kyle. Um, next slide, please. All right, and now we're going to go back to Vanessa to talk about how you can write and get uh, letters to the editor published. Hi, everyone. So thank you again for joining us this afternoon, and I hope you get to enjoy some of that nice weather today. Uh, so next slide, please. Let's start with the basics. Uh, what is a letter to the editor? So a letter to the editor is often written in response to a news story or issue covered by a publication. Uh, they are published in a newspaper, magazine, or blog. Uh, they appear alongside other letters to the editor, pieces that are written by editorial staff and guest op-eds. And they are edited and accepted by the editorial staff at the publication. And they're typically 200 to 300 words. Next slide. Why should you write a letter to the editor? Well, first, you'll reach a large audience. Uh, second, appearing in a publication adds credibility to your position. Um, it gives you the opportunity to set the record straight or introduce a new point of view. Um, you are providing a resource for other advocates like us at the ACLU. And lastly, it gives you the opportunity to influence policymakers and thought leaders. Next slide. Before we dive into the content of your letter, let's break down the difference between an op-ed and an LTE. So uh, a typical LTE is 200 to 300 words uh, max. So you'll need to get to the point right away. Um, LTEs are a direct response to a piece that's already been published in a paper and are submitted usually within a day or two when, of when the original piece was published. Um, op-eds are longer. They're about 500 to 750 words, uh, which gives you more space to die to a larger argument or story with room for anecdotes and statistics. And for op-eds, there's a lot more back and forth of the editing process and requires more lead time before your piece is published. Next slide. What makes an LTE effective? Let's go through some do's and don'ts. Uh, First and foremost, 
with a 200 to 300 word count, you're going to want to get to the point quickly and you'll want a strong and clear, clearly stated point of view. Um, one thing that could be valuable to an LTE is to include a personal connection or personal experience in your letter. And if you don't have a personal connection, you can make an argument with supporting statistics or data. And um, you'll want to connect your point of view to your personal values and explain why this issue matters to you. Um, name names. Who are the lawmakers and public figures that you want to influence? And include a call to action for lawmakers or people in power. Um, this can be a simple request to support or oppose a piece of legislation. Next slide. For the don'ts, um, don't focus on wonky policy details or worry about making a definitive, comprehensive case. You know, remember to focus on your personal connection or your experience. Um, of course, don't be rude or use abusive language that targets the paper or your opponents. And lastly, don't send an LTE over the word limit. Pro tip, every publication will have a page on their website with the word count details. Next slide. How should you start your letter? Easy. Just start by referencing the previously published article that you're writing about. And here are four examples of how you can do that. So you'll get to the point, state your point of view clearly, and provide the name and date of the article that you're referencing. Next slide. When is the right opportunity? The right timing is when your topic is already in the news, uh, especially when it's tied to a current event or bill in the legislative cycle. And also you'll wanna submit within a day or two of the piece that you're responding to. And you'll want to submit to publications where you have a local connection. So think about the local papers in your area. Next slide. How do I get my letter accepted? Well, start by targeting those smaller papers. A smaller circulation means it's more, more likely to be published. I live on the north side of Denver and we have a great local paper called the North Star. So start to think of publications like that. Um, you'll wanna write a short intro paragraph to accompany your letter. And this is where you would mention your local connection to that paper or include your contact information for follow-up, like your you know, a phone number and email address. And always check with the publication's website for the most updated and accurate contact information. And send the full body of the LTE, send the full LTE in the body of your email so that the recipient doesn't have to download or hunt for it. Next slide. And other tips, if you haven't heard back from them in two days, give them a call or send a follow-up email. And if one outlet turns you down, try another one. Persistence here pays off. Next slide. I will pass it back to my colleague, Deanna Hirsch. Hi again. Um, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about social media. And so um, I am a huge fan of social media when it's used for good. And we're gonna show you how to do that now. Um, next slide, please. So first things first, if you're not following ACLU of Colorado, um, go ahead and get out your phones, follow us at ACLU of Colorado on all platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We made it nice and easy. Um, this is a great way to stay up to date and share um, on breaking news, calls to actions um, with your networks. Next slide, please. So each platform has a different uh, audience. And so we're gonna start with Instagram, which tends to trend a little bit younger. Um, so an easy way to share our Instagram content with your followers is through stories. So if you notice, um, we have an example of one of our posts and then how you can share that to your stories. You do that by clicking that third icon at the bottom of your image and then add that post to your story. Um, from there, you can optimize it with or customize it with stickers, with additional text, um, something a little more personal for um, the people who follow you. And then you can share it um, either to your story or with close friends. Next slide. So Facebook um, tends to skew a little bit older, but a great way to reach out with um, different folks in your network. Facebook's a great place to engage your parents, grandparents, anyone who might not be on Insta and Twitter. You can share our Facebook posts uh, simply by clicking share. It's that easy at the bottom right corner. Um, and then from there, you also have options to add additional text. You can share to a Facebook story, 
You could send it in Messenger to some specific friends that you think would be interested or on Facebook groups that allow. Um, you can also RSVP to the events that we post on our Facebook page and then invite your friends to join as well. Next slide, please. And then Twitter. Um, so Twitter is probably your best bet to stay most current on any breaking news at the ACLU and then be able to uh, share that. Twitter is the place to be for calling on legislators. It's also a great place to connect with journalists. They're all over Twitter as well. Um, both groups are super active and engaged there. Um, so are your legislators. Um, and so Twitter is, is a place for you to check out if you're not there already. Um, it's also where we live tweet during some of our hearings. And so if you're wanting to follow along with what's happening during a, during a particular hearing, um, you might catch some updates on our channel as well. Um, we respond to breaking news there. We also share longer threads on complex issues. So it's a great way to get more information. Um, and we also share um, tweets from partners as well. To retweet our posts, you wanna click the square with the two arrows. We have it circled in that, in that example. And then you can simply retweet it or you have the option to quote tweet. And from there, you can add a little text that's personal to why this issue matters to you. Um, and you can also tag your legislators. Next slide, please. Um, finally, we have action alerts. So engaging with ACLU action alerts is a really great way to call on legislators and make an impact and to do it um, in a short amount of time. So each action alert comes ready to go. It has sample text about the issues um, and the legislators that it'll be sent to. All you have to do is enter your name, your address, your email and phone, and then click send. It's that easy. Um, once you send the alert, you'll also be able to make a donation in any dollar amount to support the work of the ACLU. Um, you can become an ACLU Colorado member for as little as $20, um, which really can make such a big difference. Um, it's the small donations that all add up to um, helping us take on the big risky cases and also um, working for change. So. Um, if you have any questions about that, we can chat after. Um, and then next up, uh, we'll pass it back to Kyle. All right. Um, just a reminder, I thought I already was following ACLU of Colorado and I wasn't. Weird. Um, I just probably see it in my feed because others post it and I assumed. So go and follow them um, or check and make sure you are as I needed to do. If you can please go to the next slide. So thank you, Deanna, for that extremely helpful rundown of kind of the inner workings and the basics of social media. Um, although many folks would assume that it is common sense or intu intuitive, I have found that with the ever changing status of social media, that's not the case. So it's always extremely helpful to have that rundown. And today I'm really excited to chat with y'all about how do we now take our foundational knowledge of social media and how do we use it for strategic good for campaigns that we're working on. I'm going to give um, an example and use our clean slate bill uh, as a guide to how we've used social media successfully, but you can do it with any campaign. It could be another bill. It can be a measure at a local city council or a school board, or it can be a ballot measure. So just keep that in mind that this can be used for many different types of issues in all of the different avenues to get them across the finish line. Next slide, please. For people who don't know who Healthier Colorado is, uh, we advocate on the broad spectrum of health. We pass policy so everyone has the opportunity to live a healthy life. Why Clean Slate Colorado? It's because we see the strong connection between people being able to find employment, to support their families, to put a roof over their heads. And we know that those uh, foundational elements or social determinants of health are huge predictors of having other health outcomes on the other side of this. So that's why we're very excited to be a part of this coalition because we know we're gonna see a lot of those positive outcomes. Next slide, please. 
So what are we gonna chat about quickly today? One, um, we're gonna talk about planning your social media campaign. Um, after you have your plan, we gotta talk about building awareness. Um, we always wanna post the success of our campaign along the way. And then what are some different ways or strategic uses of social media to build support? And then I have an example of, we don't always have to be so rigid in everything we do. And so I have an example of um, having a little fun with social media to help one of our other legislative campaigns. Next slide, please. First, I just want to acknowledge my two team members here at Healthier Colorado. I cannot, we cannot as an organization do the, the fun work and amazing work that, that we do without Leo, who is our digital advocacy manager and Rebecca, who is our advocacy manager. So kudos to those two for all of their great work because they've been a huge part of the success we've had with Clean Slate. Next slide, please. All right, so planning your campaign. Um, again, a lot of these things may seem common sense, but it's always really great to have a reminder and it's good to take the time to sit down and think through the process. I think a lot of folks don't take that time and then we end up fixing it along the way, if you will. So what are you planning to do? Um, are you wanting to run a bill at the Capitol? Are you wanting to do a measure through city council or like I said, through a school board? Is this a local ballot measure? Is it a statewide ballot measure? Is it something at your PTA where you're trying to amend the bylaws? There's so many ways that you can use social media to get your really important issue across the finish line. So first things first, you gotta understand the context. If it's a statewide issue, then you're gonna wanna start thinking uh, as a statewide issue, right? How does this policy affect the different communities around the state? We have a diverse state and we wanna make sure that we're connecting with everybody. If it's a local issue, how do we make sure that the people in our local community um, connect with our messaging and understand that this policy is gonna benefit everybody? So keep those things in mind when you're starting to plan. The other thing to know is start mapping out what are the steps in the different processes that you are going to be talking about via social media? So are there public hearings? Is there a voter registration deadline that you want everyone in your local community to know? Like if you, um, this doesn't really uh, relate to Colorado because we can register to vote up until election day, but I know in other states who do have voter registration deadlines, this is really important. Are we petition gathering? Is this something that we're trying to get on the ballot? So do we wanna let folks know, hey, if, if you hear or see someone gathering petitions and you, you hear them talking about this issue, please go ahead and sign. We need X amount of people to support this so we can get it on the ballot and vote for it. One thing to always consider when planning your social media campaign, if you have the time, it's not always the luxury, but if you have the time, Definitely go ahead and get your social media graphics and your content drafted prior to the actual campaign. It's going to save you a lot in the long run, and it'll make sure that you're really ramped and ready to go when um, you need when, when you really do need the content. And then if you for certain platforms, you can pre schedule things uh, for others, you cannot. If you have the luxury, uh, please go ahead and designate. Um, either a paid staff person or a volunteer to be the, the point for your social media stuff. Next slide. So building awareness. So this is something that is really important. Uh, Vanessa talked about it as well. Like once it becomes in the news and it's an issue, you really wanna make sure everyone hears about it, knows about it and understand why it's important to them. So let the computer, let your community first know that we're working on this. This is why we're working on this. It also helps to make sure that decision makers know about your campaign. Um, definitely start talking about it before, say, the bill is introduced or before it gets on the ballot. You're going to want to share really relevant information. Uh, again, why this is important, who this is going to help, what types of things that are current barriers 
uh, to the issue that you're trying to solve and then important messaging. So we wanna make sure that we're always getting the messaging that, that we've thought through before into our social media graphics. And then post regularly enough. So that can mean different things for different campaigns. If this is a statewide ballot measure, you're probably gonna to wanna to be posting weekly, if not multiple times per week. And then as the election day comes up, you're gonna to wanna to post a little more. Again, same with state issues at the Capitol, start slowly, ramp it up over those important milestones like committee and floor votes. And this is an example of a tweet that we put out about Clean Slate. Uh, just to keep people informed and to let people know that this issue is still important. Uh, we just sat in committee for about longer than four weeks, I believe. Uh, so we just wanted to remind folks that uh, this was still, still happening and really important. And you can see here, everything's on brand. It's definitely one of our messages around employment, helping people um, get into the workforce. Next slide, please. And then, Something that I don't think we do enough of, but definitely something to plan for is elevating your success along the way. Like we, we have all of these milestones, whether they're small or large, and we should definitely be highlighting them. One is it makes sure that people know that you're participating in and or helping to lead a winning campaign. If you're constantly posting about, look, we did this today for this, this issue. We won this fight for this issue. People are gonna wanna get involved. They're, they're gonna be jazzed about it and they're gonna be excited about the things that you're working on. Um, tag relevant people and use your appropriate hashtags. As you can see on this example to the left, we've tagged Senator Robert Rodriguez and Senator Dennis Heisey. He, both of those gentlemen are the Senate sponsors of this bill. And then, it's also an opportunity to share relevant information that perhaps other folks didn't, did, did, didn't quite know yet. So when this bill passed out of Senate committee, it passed with bipartisan support. And as we're trying to get this through the Senate, that's definitely really important, especially as it makes its way to the House. So um, definitely include those, those pieces of information as you're talking about your wins. Like what was also something cool about this win that maybe folks didn't realize? And so here's just an example of a post that we did to um, announce that we passed the, the first Senate committee, which was the Senate Jud Judiciary Committee. And you'll see there it passed unanimously. We passed, we tagged all the right folks, which are those people who were on the committee and voted in favor of it. Next slide, please. And so I talked a little earlier about using social media strategically. So here's two really good examples and I'll give y'all a little bit of background. When we introduced the Clean Slate Bill, we really wanted to prioritize making it a bipartisan bill. And we are so grateful that Senator Dennis Heisey um, is one of our bill champions. He's been a huge supporter and advocate for this all the way through the process of the Senate. And we wanted to make sure that um, he was getting some love from other Republicans uh, along the way to make sure that not only him, but other Republicans in the Senate and the House also knew that this was an important issue. This wasn't diverse. This, this wasn't only a Democratic-led thing that everybody supported this. So one really fun way we were able to do that is we got the uh, House of Representative member from Utah, who was a Republican, who authored this bill back in 2019 and got it passed unanimously. We had him author an op-ed and we got it submitted in Senator Heisey's district. Um, I know Vanessa talked about how important those op-eds can be. This is an example on the left side um, of what that is, the guest column. And then we also got um, people who maybe Senator Dennis Heisey um, you know, trusts and interacts with on a normal basis. And so the American Conservative Union for Justice, they um, tweeted out a big thank you to Senator Heisey for um, his leadership on Clean Slate Colorado Bill. Again, another nod, another way to support him and advertise that we have broad bipartisan support for this bill. Next slide, please. So I'm happy to let everyone know that today, Senate Bill 99, the Clean Slate Bill, passed its second committee, Senate Appropriations, unanimously. It made it on to the consent calendar 
and it also passed second readings today. So that's a huge win. And you can see that all of these efforts, uh, not only the social media efforts, but the efforts of the policy team and um, the people in the Capitol have really made this very successful. So I just wanted to share that with everyone. Next slide, please. And then having fun with it. This is a different piece of legislation that we're working on in can, um, alongside the ACLU of Colorado as well. And we wanted to make a really tough conversation a little more relatable for people. So HB 1131 um, raises the age of childhood uh, arrest and prosecution from uh, nine and younger to, to 12 and younger. And so um, this is just a fun way we were able to use something that we knew a lot of people would connect with and relate to on how to talk about why arresting a 10 year old is bad and how the over criminalization of normal childhood behavior has become a really big problem. And so you see here, we had a little fun with it, but we're still talking about that serious issue, um, but also giving something that people can relate to. So just always a reminder, if you can, um, try and have fun with it, try and uh, think outside the box and there's always ways to do that. Next slide, please. So that is the end of my presentation. I think there's questions for the three of us, um, whoever has any. If you feel like giving Healthier Colorado or making sure you're following, if you thought you were, here are our um, Instagram handle, Twitter, and, and our Facebook. And again, I'm just really grateful to be a part of this group today and thankful to, to join y'all and talk about social media. Thank you so much. Um, next slide, please. Um, so if there's any questions uh, related to what we have presented today, please go ahead and put those in the Q&A box um, and we'll, we'll give you some time to, to think about it. I know we've just given you a whole lot of information. Um, and while you have a moment to, to put your thoughts together, I wanted to give a um, special shout out. Thank you again, Kyle, so much um, for all of the amazing information you shared. Congratulations on the victory that you shared today. Um, it really shows how all of this does work um, to create change. Um, I'd also like to um, just recognize uh, the team members involved in making this happen today. Thank you so much to um, Miriam for doing our land acknowledgement. Thank you, um, especially to Ivan Popov. He is our communications assistant who has been helping with all of the tech support and making sure that this runs smoothly today. So thank you, Ivan. Thank you, of course, to Vanessa for um, leading on LTEs. And then um, uh, Cassandra Rinda Morales, who is heading up this whole wonderful week of action. There are more events to come. And um, so we hope that you will join us for those as well. Um, while we're waiting on any questions, um, wanted to also, oh, actually, I see one right now. So best practices when tweeting. Um, best practices when tweeting. Um, Kyle, do you want to share a little bit about um, what have been the best practices um, for your work around tweeting? Sure, and thanks for the question. First, a lot of people love pictures. Um, it's, it's statistically true that more folks interact with any sort of post that accompanies a picture. However, you don't have to have a picture. We've had a lot of examples where like a thread has been really successful at getting a message out. Something to think about is the limit in characters. So you're really gonna wanna be on message with what you're tweeting. Um, if you are going to be tagging important people or decision makers, um, I know Vanessa talked to, or Deanna talked about this, but you're, you're gonna wanna make sure that um, you are not alienating them. Um, I'm definitely guilty of this in, in previous careers where I thought I was helping to get them onto my side, but I actually ended up hardening the position that I didn't want them to be in um, with, with some social media posts. So always be conscious of that as well. Use relevant hashtags. Right now, if it's like a legislative effort, hashtag coledge or copolitics, um, if your campaign has a hashtag, that's always important as well.
Great, and I'll open the next one to the group as well. Um, when you craft social media communications, how do you think about striking the right tone for the current issue or goal? So Paul, I think this is, this is a very good question. And as a communications person, something I stress about constantly, but I think the right way to do this is when you are in that planning stage, uh, whether it's a small group or a large group that you take the time to really tailor and narrow down your messaging, because that's gonna be extremely helpful in everything that you put out, all the documents you create, so you don't have to constantly be second guessing, is this something I should be saying? Because you're already gonna have your messaging created. And the more you're putting out your message, the better I tell folks, if you're sick of saying it, then um, you're still not saying it enough. So I think that's one thing that you do, but also take into mind um, relevant pulse of the state or the community uh, as we know, crime is a popular topic of conversation right now. And um, so be, not that it's not true, but we decided to focus our messaging on employment, that getting people into the workforce is critical right now post pandemic, that building the economy is something that um, clean slate legislation will help with. So also think about the current um, political or uh, neighborhood realities that may exist that may also help you strike that balance of what the issue is and really resonate with people. That's great. There's um, This is a really interesting question too. Um, so if I'm just a layperson activist, what do you recommend um, on social media if I'm trying to get outside of my own bubble or echo chamber and reach people with different perspectives who are persuadable? Just a few thoughts that I have. So I follow um, not only uh, the general ACLU accounts and then partners, but also um, folks who maybe don't hold the same positions just to see, you know, what is the conversation? What are the concerns? Um, so that I can also be informed um, from outside of that, uh, as you phrased it, uh, echo chamber. Um, Kyle, Vanessa, do you have any other tips on how to get out of your own bubble? I, I think um, following people that you that you may not agree with 100% of the time, again, is a great way um, to get out of your bubble. Um, some of us on this call may not um, agree with everything American Conservative Union is posting. However, some of us might, but um, again, like they're supporting Clean Slate. So um, it's an also a good way to see where you can, can partner and agree on. You know, I think finding those opportunities is really important these days. I'm engaging with those posts, um, following for sure. But if you do find that, you know, common ground, um, engaging with the poster and the post itself and elevating it. And I would just add, I think, you know, this makes me think also, you know, not just on social media, but getting out of the bubble of what you might consume in terms of uh, the papers you read, um, you know, thinking back to the part of the LTE um, part of the presentation. And so hearing what the dissenting opinions are, reading different publications, maybe than you normally gravitate to, to get a wider scope. Um, I think that also works well. Um, Kyle, this one would be for you. Um, just additional questions on any next step or help with Clean Slate or any of the work you're doing. Uh, I love that question, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm putting in the chat right now, but if you go to cleanslateco.org, under the resources tab, there is a social media toolkit and resource guide. Um, again, we were able to pre-plan for this. And so all of that stuff was available upon our launch. Please take a minute to go there. There's an action alert up that can be sent to the whole Senate. We'll be switching that over to the House as soon as it passes the Senate, likely tomorrow. Um, that's a big way to help. So thank you for asking that question. Okay, so this next one from Andra, um, wondering how to strategize posting and digital dialogue when you're supporting multiple campaigns. How do you choose which campaigns to prioritize and at what times? 
I think it's always good to have a, a calendar of what you know is happening and plan for that and definitely build in room for the rapid response work because that's the stuff that will occupy a lot of your time. I see Kyle nodding his head. Yes, um, especially for like a local campaign where you, again, in that pre-planning process, you can kind of talk about what are the steps and milestones of this policy. Um, it really links nicely with, if you know that you're submitting an LTE or an op-ed, you can schedule in, pencil in, hey, I'm gonna wanna post this when it gets published and promote that um, piece. Uh, right now, Healthier Colorado has one, two, three, four bills all moving at the same time. And so that question is extremely relevant. I'm sure the ACLU is also in the same boat. And I think the only answer to that question is, I guess it, it, it depends on how much of, of a priority they are for you. Like we rank certain bills by priorities and, and then that also then deems how much uh, capacity we can put into them. So all of our tier one get the most. Um, we definitely had like this week, for example, we talked about, okay, we're putting out a tweet this morning, and then we're also going to be tweeting out today about Clean Slate, and we have a bill being introduced today, so we're probably going to have to move that introduction tweet until tomorrow. And so just if things don't have to be immediate, it's good to be flexible, um, but if they are immediate, then definitely go ahead and get that information out. But then also, if you know that you're posting a lot, Call, call your friends, call the bill sponsor, see if they can also help you elevate it if, you're, if you fear it's gonna get lost in everything else that, that, that you're putting out. Awesome. I love this next question. Do legislators read op-eds or LT, LTEs anymore? Do you think it's a good use of time and does it help move them? And I know my feelings on this are absolutely they do. Um, very much so. Uh, and you can also, and I've done this in the past, you can, once your LTE or your op-ed is published, you can send it to them directly. You can share it on social and tag them. Um, so I absolutely think they're a great tool, but uh, Vanessa, Kyle, do you agree? Yeah, and absolutely. It's part of why we're, you know, pushing you to choose publications that are in your local area, because we know that your legislator is going to read the paper in that local area. And I can just give you all a few examples. We, I had one in, in the slide deck, again, from the legislator from Utah. We were able to, one, really shore up our support with, with Senator Heisey. And then he was also then able to take that and others to other um, Republican members on the, the Senate Judiciary Committee and say, look, like this is something that everyone agrees on. These are your people. Uh, I, we hope we can count on your support. Uh, we also used an LTE campaign, again, those shorter written opinion pieces in Jeffco um, over the school board masking stuff. And we were able to get a ton of LTEs published in all of the local papers in and out of Jeffco to give the school board enough cover to be like, no, the community does support, support this, um, you know, while a majority of folks might be coming in opposition in person, here, here are the 15 letters that I've read in, all, in my local paper who do support this. So absolutely, they're very helpful, especially if you use them. If you submit them, get them published, and then don't use social media, don't give it to the decision makers, and don't promote it, then sure, then maybe folks won't see it. You, uh, it's definitely a multi-step process. Agreed. And this next question, are there any publications that publish more letters than others? Um, I can offer that um, publications definitely give preference to folks who live in those areas, um, especially the smaller papers. They really do want folks um, who have that zip code, who have that address. Um, and then, of course, there are larger publications that um, like the Denver Post, like um, the Gazette, who uh, really want things that are timely and so paying attention to what they've already published um, and getting in uh, around in a timely fashion. Um, certain publications also will offer um, a little more 
um, flexibility when it comes to word count. So just insider tip, the Aurora Sentinel, um, not so strict about word count, other ones are. Um, so really, you know, in terms of getting letters published, um, really adhering to, you know, the things that Vanessa outlined, um, if something is ready to go, editors are so inundated with a volume of letters um, and op-eds that if something is ready to go and doesn't need a lot of work, it meets the word count, it's edited, um, has a clear point of view, it's timely, those are things that move it to the top of the line. Um, so really following those best practices um, will get you ahead when it comes to publishing. Um, this next question from Kelly, um, do you see TikTok becoming a more important advocacy channel? Um, Vanessa, I see you hopping off. I absolutely do. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I think it's one, it's an emerging platform and emerging platforms um, usually tend to be on the cutting edge of like digital practices. I think that TikTok both allows you, someone had mentioned, like, how do you get outside of your echo chamber? It allows you to really kind of receive content from creators that you normally wouldn't follow. And so it creates more like a discovery process for viewers. And I think it also reaches demographics that you might not, as a creator, um, that you might not normally or traditionally reach. So I think in that sense, it's a powerful tool. Kyle, have you all used TikTok or seen it effective in, in the work that you do? So I'm such an old millennial. Um, <laughs> I am embarrassed to say I don't have a TikTok account. However, I did have a whole section about being creative and having fun with it. So Kelly, thank you for this question. It's definitely inspiring me um, to maybe do more, but absolutely. Um, it's an emerging platform and definitely a good way to reach, as Vanessa said, different people, especially young people who are increasingly, increasingly eager and excited to get involved in a lot of the issues that we're working on. Awesome. And um, gonna open this up. So what are some of your favorite podcast or factual news sources? Kyle, you wanna take this one first or Vanessa? Well, I also want the audience to put in the chat which podcast they like. Yes, absolutely. My boss would be very upset if I didn't mention our podcast. It's called The Wooden Teeth Show. It's pretty great. Uh, go ahead and give it a follow. Um, I'm honestly, I love really quick, short podcasts because it's usually I'm listening to them on my on my ride to work, on my to and from the gym, stuff like that. And so the Colorado Sun has a 15 minute update every day that I really appreciate. Um, it just gives you a quick overview of some really high topic things that are relevant to Colorado. I see that Taylor put CityCast in the chat and absolutely everybody should follow CityCast ever. And of course the daily, you gotta have a daily dose of the daily. <laughs> Yeah, CityCast is, is definitely a fave. And recently, um, there, our own uh, staff attorney, Sarah Neal, was on talking about um, one of our cases. So you can go back and check that out. It's a really great episode um, and just a great uh, insight into, into some local uh, news that's going on. Um, I think those have been some amazing questions. Thank you all so much. Um, and please continue to share your Oh yes, KG and you, that's a good one too. Yeah, keep sharing um, your podcast. We always love to discover new things too. Um, thank you again, everyone for joining us today. Um, next slide, please. So we have um, a post event survey. We would so appreciate if you would take the time to fill this out and Ivan's um, dropped in the chat information on that. Um, we really do take your feedback into account, it helps us to improve this, especially as this is our, our very first uh, lobby week of action. Um, we are delighted to be able to bring you um, even more information and want to um, tailor it to serve you in the best way possible. So please, if you could fill that out, we'd greatly appreciate that. And while you're doing that, um, we would love to share a very special performance by the Denver Gay Men's Chorus.
the parade passes by I'm gonna go and taste Saturday's high life before the parade passes by I'm gonna get some life back into my life I'm ready to move out in front I've had enough of just passing my life with the rest of them the best of them I can hold my head up high for I've got a goal again I've got to drive again I'm gonna feel my Um, thank you again to the Denver Gay Men's Chorus. Thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, and a special thanks to all of our Week of Action ambassadors. Um, if you haven't had a chance to fill out the survey, please do. And please join us for the rest of um, our offerings for this week. And thank you again so much. Um, and special thanks again to Kyle with uh, Clean Slate. We really appreciate you. Um, and here's to a great digital or a great week of action going forward. Um, and thank you to all of you. <laughs>